today on CityCast Salt Lake, these winter storms have made for some great snow. But getting to resorts up the Cottonwoods via public transit has been painful. Just ask the dozens of skiers getting left behind at the ski bus stop. But why? Why is it so bad this year? I asked Kyle Holland because he co-hosts an entire local podcast dedicated to transit, and he's been investigating this particular problem. It's Thursday, January 26th, 2023. I'm Ali Vallarta, and this is CityCast Salt Lake. Kyle Holland, co-host of the Redline Transit podcast. You ski. I don't ski. Tell me about your experience riding the bus up Cottonwood Canyon this year. Oh, I do ski. We've been getting such wonderful snow this year. It is I know. unbelievable. So, you know, I'm not the only one who wants to ski. Therefore, canyon traffic, horrible, as always. Maybe even worse than always. That's what I'm picking up, is that it's, like, exceptionally bad. Yeah, turns out cars are maybe maybe the worst possible way to get a bunch of people up the same route to the same place at the same time. Who would have thought? Break it down for me. Like, tell me about your worst day so far riding <sighs> this UTA bus up, what, Little Cottonwood? I've been doing Big Cottonwood because Solitude okay. is unlimited on the Icon Pass, and I'm a student, so I get discounts. That's right. I'm going to say that I've gotten the lucky end of riding the ski bus. I've always been careful to go early enough that I catch one of the buses going from the garage and not coming back down the canyon. And then I've also been cutting my day two or three hours short in hopes of actually making it back on the first bus. So what I can do for you is relay um, some friends' experiences of getting passed up by several full ski buses and not making it home till late in the evening, like 8 or 9 p.m. Yeah, For reference, lifts brutal. close at 4, so it's nasty. Yeah. The ski bus service cut. Uh, Big Cottonwood, they cut service in half, so 15 down to 30. And then Little Cottonwood, they had two routes. They cut one of them, cut the other one in half, so that's one-third the buses, so... Not enough room for everybody. Yeah. I mean, I've also seen photos on Twitter where it's just like people are really packed in like sardines. Yeah, well, it's always like that. Not not, not exactly the best thing in the world, but as long as we make it down the canyon. Right. But the problem is that it's so packed that people just straight up are getting passed up. They're not getting yes, on the bus. Yes, that's the real issue. Like, I can put up with a ski bus sardine can, especially when traffic's light. If traffic's light and you can make it out of the canyon in like, I don't know, 20 minutes or whatever— unload a third, a half of the bus at the mouth of the canyon park and ride, then everybody sits down, go to tracks, done. That's a total vibe. Mm -hmm. But getting passed up by full buses, getting stuck in horrible traffic management for, like, hours on end doesn't work. Yeah. Well, I guess my question is, if the bus isn't necessarily a better experience than driving or carpooling with friends— Who's riding the bus and why do you think they're sticking it out? It's not necessarily better, but it's also not necessarily worse. You're stuck in the exact same traffic as all the cars, except you're not paying for it. If you have a season pass or an icon pass or any, anything like that, you can probably get on the bus for free. If not, it's only 10 bucks for a round trip. So you're not paying for it. And you also don't have to drive because driving in bumper to bumper traffic, you have to keep your full attention forward for like an hour or however long it takes, maybe two hours, stop, go, stop, go. You can't like zone out and look at Twitter, right? So we get lots and lots of park and riders who will drive to, some poor souls try to drive to the mouth of the canyon and get on the ski bus there. Most of them get passed up because it's already full. And then some of the more crafty people will go park at the tracks parking lot, get on the first stop. Huh, okay. And then of course, baseline of transit riders off the blue line. Transfers are terrible with half-hour service this year. And some people get on in, in between. I don't know, dude. Like, how fun is skiing? I think it is a lot of fun. and It's worth it? You know, I'm usually not feeling it for most of the time between waking up early and being stuck in traffic halfway up the mountain. But by the time you get on the lift, worth it in an instant. Okay. I believe you. I have heard from friends who have been the people either on the full bus or watching the bus pass them by and knowing that it could be another hour because they're not getting on that one. And the big question that it feels like is on 
everyone's mind who doesn't have a transit themed podcast <laughs> is how did we get here? What are the factors that have contributed to a particularly bad time this year? UTA will come out and tell you that it is due to a labor shortage of they're not able to get enough bus drivers, but UTA won't really elaborate on that. I will elaborate on that. Uh, UCA does not have enough bus drivers because they're not providing the pay, the schedule, the benefits that make such a hard job attractive enough to make it worth it for potential bus drivers. Mm. So, Mm. for example, current UCA pay scale is about $20 to $25 an hour for a bus driver. And I think they get a little bit extra, maybe a couple bucks to drive the ski routes, which, you know, great and all, but you're also driving a 35-foot-long, tens of thousands of pounds steel can down a windy canyon road with 90 poor souls in the back dealing with angry passengers, and you've got zero room for error. Right. This is a highly skilled job. It is a very skilled job. Heck, even the the in-the-valley bus routes, just being a normal city bus driver, that is a skilled job. And you need lots of training and employee retention if you want people who are good at that. I mean, starting rate of 20 bucks an hour, I did look up a job posting for a UTA bus driver in Midvale, and that $25 rate is like, right now it looks like the cap after five years. That's what they advertise, yeah. Yeah, you're starting at what? That's about 40 grand a year before taxes. Yeah. I think we can all agree that's like not really a living wage in this valley. Yeah. I mean, some people can certainly make it a living wage, like if you're lucky sure. enough to live alone and gotten your college paid for, but once you start tacking on kids, education, you name it, it's not looking pretty. You know we love to highlight new local businesses on this show, and here's one for you. The Juice Shop a really delightful neighborhood juicery in the Maven District. They've got cold-pressed juices, smoothies, grain bowls, toasts, and superfood snacks. So that when you haven't eaten yet and it's 2 p.m., you can get fuel to keep doing the things you love. Think of the juicery as your alternative to dirty soda culture. We deserve a delicious option that doesn't make us crash later. The Juice Shop has fast Wi-Fi, comfy seating, and great vibes for knocking out emails or power lunching with a friend. Pop by their location on 9th South and 2nd East, or visit thejuiceshopslc.com and tell them we sent you. Trying to find a place to rent year after year can be exhausting and expensive. But it feels like home prices are starting to cool. So why keep paying your landlord's mortgage? If you wanna make the transition from renter to homeowner, the place to start getting organized is the How to Buy a Home podcast. Host David Sidoni is an industry expert who has helped thousands of people buy their first homes. And he can help you too. David can guide you through next steps that are right for you, whether you're planning to buy in the next year or five years from now. He can even connect you with a patient local realtor who won't blow you off. Start planning with a free home buying starter kit at howtobuyahome.com and make this the last year you rent. Find How to Buy a Home on YouTube and wherever you listen to podcasts. Can you talk to me about the scheduling? Because I've heard whispers of this, but I don't fully understand Uh, it. Why is scheduling such a nightmare? This is another thing that scares off um, new bus drivers, is that in a situation where UTA does not have enough bus drivers, and by does not have enough, I don't mean they're 10 short, had to cut a couple routes. I mean, they're tens, dozens, hundreds of bus drivers short. So they have eaten through all of their padding in the entire system, like pretty much all of the slack to the point where they're forced to cut service and sometimes even unexpectedly miss bus trips. So bus drivers are getting all sorts of nasty shifts. Like I heard one of my co-host's friends became a bus driver for UTA, third day on the job, gets a 10-hour shift. 
And then there's what we call the extras board, where you get to fill in all the oddball shifts and call-ins and everything that the more senior bus drivers didn't want, where you call UTA at like 5 p.m. the night before, and they say, hey, you're working this tomorrow. Good luck. See you then. Wow. Wait, for how long is that the case? What, do you, what level of seniority do you have to reach before your schedule is predictable? That depends on what transit system you work for and how healthy that system is. Um, here, we're looking at a worst case where you may have to wait years. Transit agencies that have their crap together can get enough people to volunteer to cover the extra sports, so that's not really an issue. And you might be able to get a stable schedule within a couple of weeks, but that's not the case here. So the UTA is comfortably acknowledging that the labor shortage is the problem, but they're not really, it seems, ready to address the things that are contributing to the labor shortage. Is that your is that your read? I think their PR team doesn't really want to go public or really look forward to solutions that much. I think the most they've said publicly is that they plan on, say, restoring ski bus service next season. And then they've gotten their five-year plan, some other service, small service restorations and such. What they're not saying publicly is that they are actively working with the with the bus drivers union and all that sort of stuff, working on pay raises, working on paperwork, working on scheduling, all behind the scenes. My co-host who works for Frontrunner as a train host, which is not an operating job, it's like being a conductor, you just walk around and tell people to get their feet off the seats and answer questions, <laughs> is actually expecting a pretty substantial pay raise, I think close to $5 soon as a result of all these negotiations, and everybody else should be seeing the same sort of pay bump. Interesting. So this is becoming a union story. Well, it always is. I think the reason I bring up the union is because that's just another level of bureaucracy and paperwork to make a raise happen. Well, so in acknowledgement that the ski bus is a little bit in crisis, on January 11th, the Sully County Council voted to pony up about $240,000 for what they're calling the Cottonwood Connect. It's a lot of money. And... Alta, Solitude, Snowbird, Brighton, and Visit Salt Lake are also pitching in, which is kind of nice to see mm -hmm. given that these are publicly funded buses that are dropping people at the stoop of multi-million dollar private <laughs> corporations. <laughs> what do you make of this solution? You know, I'm going to say I look forward to writing it. Huh. I haven't figured out how to like do reservations yet, and I think they're still figuring that out, but... 10 bucks round trip, um, same ticket price as the UTA ski bus, except you have to actually pay it, which is fine. But they're doing a, reserv a reservation-based system. So even though they're not actually running that many buses in the grand scheme of things, if you can get yourself a reservation, you're set for the day. Okay. But as a taxpayer who doesn't ski, is this a smart use of the county's money? Because the UTA has buses. I think it's a smart and effective way to solve the immediate issue at hand right now for this ski season because UTAs, despite having a bunch of buses sitting in the garage, heck, you might hear the snow chains dangling on a ski bus running a regular route. Um, they're not able, for organizational reasons, to use their buses up the canyon. Like, UTA can't say, hey, um, private individual who has a CDL, can you just drive this bus and we'll pay you like you're a contractor? That's not how that works. So UTA can't do anything. So the county did something. So it's fixed for now. As far as taxpayer money, I think this plays into bigger issues. Like I'll mention, of course, the gondola and the yeah. obscene amounts of money UDOT spends on maintaining and avalanche controlling the canyon roads and all that. And mm -hmm. where do you want to put the line between the ski resort pays to get people up the canyon and the government pays to get people up the canyon? Right. Yeah. In my dream world, I mean, that does. In my dream tell world, me. I want to know. The resorts would just run buses and ask people to pay for them. Like in a dream world, the resorts would have come up with this county shuttle system privately on their own before the start of the ski season and just started running it and charging people for it. Right. Unfortunately, we don't live in a dream world, and I mean. The last ski season, 2020 to 2021, broke records for all 15 resorts in Utah. So you and I and everyone listening knows that our ski industry is not slowing down. No, not at all. Where do we go from here? Uh, with transportation, more buses. Yeah. More buses and less private cars. Put up some like mm. license plate scanner based tolling systems. Toll people going up. Say, 
here's how many cars are allowed to go up per hour. Okay. Fun facts. Managing traffic. Yeah, ac- yeah, actually managing traffic instead of just not like we currently do. And fun fact, the faster a bus can make it through its scheduled route, say if it can make the route in 45 minutes instead of an hour and a half, the less buses you need to run that route. Hmm. If you can cut the yeah. end-to-end time in half, you need half as many buses. Or in our case, you could use the same number of buses to run twice as much service for the same amount of money. Right. So do you think that we're kind of in the ironic scenario right now, or you could call it a cyclical hell, of needing everyone to just bite the bullet and ride the bus, even though it's pretty miserable right now, so that we can put pressure on UTA, on state leaders, to invest more in the bus? That might be something you could say about like regular bus routes in the valley, like your office commute. That's not actually something you need to say about the ski bus. There is way more than enough demand for the ski bus service as it exists now, as bad and not really that attractive as of a transportation option as it is, we are still like hmm. bursting through the seams with riders. Hmm. <laughs> so for once, the pressure is there and the UTA, the government, you name it, it's their turn to step up. Hmm. Okay. Kyle Holland, co-host of The Red Line, thank you so much. Of course. Thank you, CityCast. Kyle speculated about labor negotiations at UTA, so we reached out to them for comment. They didn't get back to us in time, but if we do hear, I'll let you know. In the meantime, here's a little more growth news before we go. You know the Wells Fargo building in Sugar House on 21st South and Highland Drive? It is being sold at the end of the month to a developer who's planning to turn it into housing a mid-rise residential building, according to Building Salt Lake. Aside from the fact that it will significantly increase the density of what's already a pretty crammed up part of Sugar House, this building is newsworthy because it's going to be Salt Lake's first residential mass timber project. Mass timber is a building style that uses thin layers of wood glued together and factory pressed. It's cheaper to produce than concrete and steel and makes for really strong buildings that can survive earthquakes. I think when it comes to development in Salt Lake, we should prepare to hear this word more often. And I know what you're thinking. Ali Vallarta, are you telling us that we should get used to buildings being made from wood? And yes, that's actually exactly what I'm saying. Oh, and if you live in Sugar House and bank with Wells Fargo, don't panic. They're just moving across the street into the view building. That's all for us today here on CityCast Salt Lake. Thank you for listening. We will be back tomorrow morning with more from around this city. Bye.